Okay, so I think we have 28 people joining to our high school. I think that's a good number to start. So good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone, depending on where you are. Uh, welcome to the marketplace session for uh, AIM, Assessment, Measurement and Evidence Working Group and CCP, Community Level Child Protection Task Force. Um, we have the question that, yes, this, this room is open for anyone who are interested in the, the work of AIM and in the CCP task, uh, CCP task Force, our high schools. So welcome, welcome everyone. Uh, I am Chizuru Iwata. I'm a project manager for the, of the Alliance and I will be the facilitator for this session. So in this session, we will first start with the presentation by CCP task force, and then we will do some activities on the group map. Then we will pass the floor to the AIM team. So without further delay, let's start the session. So over to Michelle. Great, thank you everyone for joining us. Um, I'm very excited to welcome you to the CCP High School. Um, during the first half of this session, um, Kenna, my co-lead and myself, will be sharing the recently released research report um, from the Community Engagement Case Management Project um, share, and sharing the key findings from the research report. Um, you can find all of the resources developed with the report at this link that I'm about to drop in the chat. Um, now, I know that we discussed this during the fresh hot, in the hot off the press session, um, but what we're gonna do a little differently is we also like to hear from all of you um, on whether the findings of the research resonate with your experience with engaging volunteers in case management. What are the challenges that you've encountered what have been some of your key learnings or successes? And what tools do you think would be helpful uh, when you're trying to engage communities in case management? And then after a brief discussion around this, uh, we will then share a sneak peek of the toolkit currently under review. Um, so you'll get a chance to kind of learn a little bit more about what's already planned to be included. And hopefully, hopefully what's already planned to be included matches some of what you think would be helpful. Um, next slide, please. So um, I won't go into too much detail here because hopefully you all were at the hot off the press session, but during, 20, late tw during 2021, the Community Engagement and Case Management Project launched its exploratory study report, uh, providing a better understanding of community volunteers who have responsibilities with the case management process. So this was a comparative study of findings from a desk review of academic and gray literature. So all of those SOPs and TORs and guidance notes that you know all we all seem to be very fond of proliferating, um, and field research that included key informant interviews, a collection of field narratives where we reached out to volunteers directly and said, "Tell us about your experience. Why are you a volunteer? Share your story," and then four case studies. Um, the research found a correlation between the evidence and the field research. Um, and it, the report outlines key findings and recommendations, which we'll dive into shortly. Um, now, as I mentioned earlier today, not everyone has time to read a 50 page research report. If I hadn't read it as part of the review process, I probably wouldn't have time to read the full report. And I, maybe I shouldn't admit that, but it's true. So we also developed a study brief that's only five pages and it summarizes the key findings and recommendations. Um, perhaps we'll read that and then say, hey, this is super interesting. I want to read the full report, which is what we hope. Um, and we also sometimes know that you just want an easy to read poster to keep on the wall to remind yourself of the best practices. So we also made a seven best practices poster to support community volunteers. Um, just to let you know seven things that do work to ethically and successfully engage community volunteers based on the evidence. Um, and then finally, you know, we wanted to give child protection actors the tools to advocate to donors, policymakers, their own senior management teams or proposal development teams or finance teams on the importance of volunteers and how key decision makers can also support community volunteers. So we also have a policy brief um, that is, I believe, around three to five pages. Um, all of these supplemental resources are available in French, English, Spanish, and Arabic. The 50-page report, I'm afraid, is afraid is only available in English, but we've made the brief available in all these languages. So what were the key findings? Next slide. 
So again, I'm gonna be brief here because hopefully you all attended the, the press session. Um, and you'll remember the typology going from type one, which is like a pure volunteer to type three, which is a paraprofessional caseworker. And in the middle of this incentivized worker who should be doing basic things like referrals and identification, perhaps doing, you know, serving as a translator for caseworkers in contexts where the caseworkers and the communities don't speak the same language. Um, but that while we have this lovely idea of a typology that goes along this nice scale of, you know, different requirements, different level of hours of work, that's, the world never works as nicely as, as what we imagine. And that in reality, everything is very mixed up. So you might have a type two incentivized worker who should just be doing identification and referral, working 40 hour weeks, doing all the steps of case management with limited training and limited supervision. And this is something that I think is, a, I, I know from my experience in the field is a challenge that I've experienced that I've run into. Um, and it's not ideal and it's not necessarily the way you want things to work, but when you have limited funding, um, a large amount of areas to cover, a huge amount of need, this is what frequently happens, um, unfortunately. Um, and so what we really want to do is to understand, you know, why this is happening and then to provide tools and guidance on how can we, you know, really reevaluate how we're engaging community volunteers and how can we kind of correct course. Um, because I think we all know that this is a challenge that, that many of us are facing in our case management work and in how we're engaging with communities. Um, next slide, and I'll hand it over to Kenna to do a review of the six key findings before we dive into the discussion. Thanks, Michelle. So what are the six findings or messages? Uh, two of uh, those, two first ones actually, are more on what and the rest on how. The first one, the first message or finding, has two sides of the cone. Volunteers bring benefits. They are an asset to communities. They are an asset to uh, NGOs. But what happened, it is, as Michelle mentioned also, they are uh, often under-resourced and often overutilized to be considered volunteers. And Lead, this leads actually to the second finding or the message that actually there are unclear role, lack of support for them, and there are uh, some interesting power dynamics, which the mix of all together leads into the unsustainable potential exploitive dynamic. Now, how to best manage this risk of those dynamics? Here it comes a third message, which calls for relevance and ownership, hence ask for communities to be involved in all aspects of volunteer engagement. In my experience, we often involve community in the project design, in the implementation, but when it comes to volunteers, it's sometimes this is perceived as NGO work. The third finding and um, message as well is that uh, the communities have to be involved from the get-go in all aspects of volunteer engagement. Now, um, what we can do to manage the risk and to um, leverage the potential that uh, the, the volunteers, as I said, that they bring to the community. Here comes the message for the risks faced by, by volunteers, children, fam families, should be mitigated as much as possible from the initial phase, but also throughout the engagement. And what else can we do to manage the risk and uh, to maximize, as I mentioned, their potential? This leads to message five, coordination. Child, prote uh, child protection partners must coordinate among themselves in order to harmonize the approaches and standards for volunteer engagement in order to build upon and complement each other's standards and also to fill on the gaps and to um, put focus on the areas that uh, actually are uh, a gray area. The sixth, the sixth and the last uh, message and finding uh, outline another strategy on how to address the aforementioned, and it is about investment. And here comes, uh, this is a, a message as well for those who have the power to invest, could be government, could be donors, NGOs, civil society, 
there is an urgent need to invest in child protection workforce as a whole. And this goes equally to the community volunteers and uh, trained and paid caseworkers. Um, so what is the process after that? Um, over to you, Michelle, for this exciting news. So um, we wanted to have a discussion uh, before we kind of do an overview of the, um, before we do an overview of the resources that will be released in January, we wanted to do a discussion. So you can clip, clip. <laughs> I apologize, it's been an early morning. You can click on the group map link in that, um, which I will do now um, as well. And then is it okay if I share my screen to show the group? Oh, already being done. Thank you, Jessica. Um, and we, what we would like you to do is to kind of go through this reflection process that, that we've also gone through over the past year, year and a half or so. Um, so we'd like you to think about, um, I think this is not the right one that you're sharing. This is for the a one. Um, so many group maps. Um, so we wanted to take you on the same journey that we've been on over the past year and a half, almost two years at this point, and to think about how are you engaging community volunteers in case management? Um, what are some key learnings you would like to share with us? What are challenges, including risks that you face? And what tools would be helpful? Um, this is sort of distilling the research process that we've been through over the past year and a half or so into like four very basic questions. Um, I, and so I think we sent it in the chat. And so if you guys can just, um, I think you know how this works, but you can just click on the little, where it has like the little plus sign and add in your thoughts on how are you engaging community volunteers? What are your learnings? What are your challenges? And what tools would be helpful? Um, I'd also like to invite you to just unmute yourself and share your thoughts, or if you have any questions on the research and the findings, this would be a really great time to, to share those questions or to ask them. Right. So I see identification and follow-up. Yep, that, that was very common um, in our research that volunteers are very frequently involved in identification of cases and then following up. Um, and if anybody wants to unmute and just ask a question directly related to the research, please feel free. I know we kind of dropped a lot of thoughts on you um, all at once. I see that one of the challenges is also um, around confidentiality. Yes, this is very true, um, especially when asking volunteers um, who may not have gone through a full case management training to support as translators or interpreters for caseworkers. It can really lead to a question around confidentiality of the case um, for, for, the, for the child involved in case management. And also if you have volunteers taking on additional responsibilities beyond what was initially designed in the TOR, such as further steps in case management and not being fully trained, this is, this is a huge risk. Um, lack of accountability, I agree, is, is also a challenge. We are having community volunteers who are, um, we are having volunteers who are, you know, very heavily engaged in case management, which gives them a position of power. But then are we ensuring that children and their families in the communities have the ability to feedback and to raise concerns? And can community volunteers become gatekeepers in a way? Um, which is definitely, oh, wow, these are all coming in, which is really interesting. Um, I think, uh, yes, if, even if they are trained, a culture of confidentiality. They're from the communities, they're working with the communities that they support. It necessarily leads to inherent challenges with confidentiality. Um, these are all really great and really exciting. Um, yes, a, a challenge is coordinating with other CP actors on approaches and incentives. I mean, in the context where I have worked, um, I won't name any specific contexts or organizations or anything, 
But where I've worked in the past, it's always been this huge challenge around how do we harmonize incentive rates? How do we, you know, how do we make sure that they're aligning at least with the minimum wage of the country we're working in? Um, you know, what do we do if we have volunteers who are essentially working full time and therefore can't access other livelihood opportunities? Um, Oh, I love this challenge, how to meaningfully engage volunteers, particularly in areas where access is limited for trained caseworkers. Um, that is a really excellent point. Um, and then I was just wondering, so um, for this point, caring for the care of the community volunteers emotional well being is not added. These are all really interesting and very much align with the findings of our research, um, as well as what we're trying to address through the toolkit. Um, it is really interesting and reassuring to see that a lot of the key learnings are key learnings that we've also found, that um, volunteers are frequently taken for granted or underappreciated, and that it's hard to change this mindset. Um, that building relationships with volunteers takes time, um, and so I think it's it's very interesting to see how we went, how much we are all on the same page and having the same challenges. Um, so I'd like to look at the tools that would be helpful. Um, so a budgeting checklist, good news, it's one of the tools. Um, releasing the power to community to manage volunteers. This is actually a centerpiece um of the of the toolkit and the and the guidance is having communities involved in determining what are the TORs like what will be the role of community volunteers in case engaged in case management working with the community to select those volunteers ensuring that there's feedback mechanisms both for community volunteers to share the challenges that they're facing but also feedback mechanisms for the community to provide feedback on the volunteers um, Training materials and resources for community level workers. We have an entire training manual that's going to be um, that's going to be part of that. Um, support to increase awareness with funders, also part of the, the toolkit. Um, we do have ideas around alternative non-payment ways of showing appreciation. Um, and then I think this one is really interesting and guidance on community-based case management, including volunteers and how this might be different from traditional practices in case management. So one of the things that's very interesting here is one of our, in the guidance, is really considering whether the traditional case management approach is the correct approach in a context. Case management very much relies on having a certain structures in place, certain services available for referrals, the resources to be properly staffed and making sure that you have properly staffed and trained um, team receiving coaching and supervision. And one of our recommendations is thinking, do, is this context correct? Like, is traditional case management the appropriate way to go in this context, considering these limitations, um, especially for uh, in this challenge around how to meaningfully engage volunteers in areas where there's limited access for trained case workers. That's actually one of our key findings is that maybe we need to rethink sometimes how we're doing case management and guidance on community-based case management is a really good next step. Um, we, uh, so I think it's really exciting to see that we cover a lot of these um, tools that would be helpful. Um, for example, sample TORs for volunteers. And so with that, I'd like to move back to the presentation um, to share some of the, of what we've been developing. Um, so what's next? You'll recognize this slide. Um, we're developing, we have a toolkit for community volunteers engaged in case management, as well as a training manual. Um, these tool, so the toolkit is going to include a guidance document and 18 tools, which sounds like a lot of tools, um, but they are very concrete and practical tools, um, such as budget, a budgeting checklist, such as guidance for volunteer selection that engages the community, and TORs for volunteers. Um, the toolkit includes guidance on the six steps to ethically engage community volunteers in case management, uh, which includes a step to assess how we're engaging community volunteers um, and like what is the current practice. 
Um, a second step to decide on how should we be engaging community volunteers based on of our, off of our assessment, what needs to change, how can we change that, what are actions that we can take now to, you know, um, have concrete change in how we're working with community volunteers, what might need more time and more advocacy towards other actors. Um, and then guidance on how to implement this uh, new approach or what you've decided to work on and change. Um, a fourth step around developing, which is really around capacity strengthening of both volunteers as well as the child protection case management team to work together as one team um, and to work on capacity strengthening. Um, a step around monitoring evaluation um, and learning uh, to, you know, to include feedback from communities, to include feedback from volunteers, to look at what we can do to improve. And then the sixth one um, is around advocacy. So how can we advocate to donors, to policymakers, governments, senior management and NGOs around the role of volunteers and the importance of, of ensuring appropriate funding, um, appropriate resourcing of teams, um, and, and having that training that's really needed. And that's support and supervision. Um, this is complemented by, um, so the tools which are used, can be used to carry out each step of this process. So it's not where you're saying, here's what you should do. We're also giving you the tools to carry it out. The tools will be in a Word document form. So they're easy to download, to modify, to fit your context and to fit, you know, the name of your organization, you know, how, you know, what do you call your volunteers um, to translate them, to print. Um, so we really try to make these tools as actionable as possible. Um, and then the training manual, is, I'm really excited for this because it's, it's just practical. It's easy to use. It doesn't require a PowerPoint. It just, all it needs is flip chart papers and markers. Um, it includes core training for community volunteers of nine modules that are, like, these are many modules that are simple to roll out and focus on what skills and knowledge they really need on a day-to-day -day basis. It doesn't go into uh, the theories and like the, you know, and the legal frameworks and what is the convention of the rights of the child. It talks about how does your community define a child? What is child protection? How does your community currently work to protect children? And really looks at um, what are the concrete skills needed? There's additional four training modules um, that can move this even deeper um, that you can use to further strengthen the skill set of the team. And then there's also five organizational workshops that can be used to address power dynamics, uh, risks facing community volunteers, and how to work as a case management team. Um, these trainings, as I mentioned, are designed in a way that are low tech, you know, not needing PowerPoint, not needing to be able to somehow, you know, have a like a monitor and a screen where you're projecting a PowerPoint um, to be given in a context without internet or electricity, et cetera. They're also designed in such a way that you don't have to sit everyone down for five days of training. Um, each session is around an hour and a half, two hours long, and you can give them one day at a time, one week at a time over a period of time. Um, so those are the resources that we've developed. Um, and I'm not sure where we are on time, and I don't want to eat into the AME working group time. Um, so can I have a time check, possibly? I think that this session ends at 9.35 my time. So I think it's, yeah. with that, I'll hand it over to Lena um, of the AME working group. And if you have any questions, um, please just pop them in the chat and we will respond to them. Oh, Thanks, and thank Michelle. you for <laughs> Thanks, Kenna and Michelle. That was a really interesting um, discussion. Um, so hi and welcome everybody. We have, uh, Christine and I are here from the AIM Working Group. So we have a much less um, structured second half of this marketplace. I saw earlier that um, Lizbeth, you had asked the question around if this is for members and the marketplace is really an opportunity for um, non-members, both members and non-members um, in particular to come and learn a bit more about the working groups. So I have kind of showcased some of what we were working on over this past year and some of the um, activities we'll be working on over this coming year. So we have um, 
we're, ba we're basically just going to open up to questions and answers. Christine and I are here to answer any questions you have related to um, any of the activities AIM is working on, or if you have general questions about the AIM working group, um, please place your questions into the Google map. So Jessica, if you can, yeah, great. So we've just um, put that in the chat there. Um, it was the initial group map that you saw that came up um, earlier in Michelle and Kenna's session. So we'll just, um, if you have any questions, if you can just type those in and Christine and I will just be pulling those out of the q and and just signing in. So any questions about A, maybe I, I'll just talk. Um, I know I went through the presentation during the pitch quite quickly. So the AIM working group has been supporting, just linking this to the overall theme of the annual meeting this year, the prevention initiative um, by working specifically on identifying, we've kind of developed several resources around the identification of risk and protective factors linked to harmful outcomes for children. Um, so there are several resources we've developed um, related to prevention. Um, great, see a question come up. Yeah, so um, working on the indicators. So I had, um, we haven't developed specific indicators um, it related to the prevention initiative. There are indicators that were developed during the child protection minimum standards revision process that are related um, to prevention. Um, there are not as many, of course, related to prevention in the CPMS as to response, which is something we recognize. Um, this past year, we have worked um, on the CPMS measurement framework we haven't actually modified any of the indicators. What we did was enhance the table so that there is additional, um, additional information included, which will be helpful um, for the application of indicators. So for instance, examples of tools um, that can be used, um, that sort of information. And then we have developed a guidance document to support practitioners in identifying and contextualizing the indicators. It's quite a long list of indicators in the CPMS. So we realized that um, it could be challenging selecting which indicators might be most appropriate for programs at the individual agency level, um, but also for coordination groups in relation to their humanitarian response programming. So, um, so, yeah, to, to answer your question, nothing specific to the prevention initiative, um, but also just to make everyone aware, um, last year we had developed a guidance document um, and a definition of child well being. And there's an additional indicator um, or ME framework that's attached to the um, child well being um, contextualization guide. So I'd encourage you all to look that up as well. Maybe Christine, you can um, add the link for that into the um, chat. And Christine, if you have anything to add as well, so I'm gonna move. Um, so another question is about the tools around participation and research. So we don't have any specific um, we don't have any specific activities that are related to developing child participation tools. Um, basically, each of the working groups and task forces um, have a work plan. So we've last year finalized um, a three-year work plan and we work with our members to identify priority activities over the next three years. We'll be revisiting that work plan with the members um, over this the coming months, just um, because the strategy, of course, for the Alliance has recently been finalized and was released yesterday. 
So we'll, we'll be looking at the strategy and ensuring that all of our activities in the work plan are aligned with the strategy. So if the development of tools around child participation specifically is something that the members want to prioritize, that's something we can certainly um, add to our work plan. Um, and also just to kind of say in addition to that, we don't have, um, we, while we develop work plans, we don't actually have you know, a, a pot of funding available. So it, whatever activities are that are in our work plan, we need to fundraise for. And we also kind of encourage our members to support fundraising efforts. Um, but um, related to child participation, there are, we had discussed this in terms of our e-learning um, series that we're developing if it was necessary to develop an e-learning module specific to child participation. And we decided um, not to do that because there are some existing e-learning resources around that. Um, but I hope that answers the question. I'm actually trying to move the questions over that I've answered into the um, answered box and I can't seem to do that. So I don't know, Jessica, if that's... Great. Um, Sorry, which ones did you answer, Selena? Just so. The two bottom ones. Um, is there a link to the work plan? Um, no, but I can send it to you. Um, if, if maybe, I'm not sure who asked that question, but I can, if you put your, num your email in the chat, we can send you the work plan. Um, if you're a member, um, we, I'm assuming you're not because we would have shared that, but please add your email address and I'm happy to share the work plan with anybody. Um, or, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, Christine? Yeah, uh, sorry, um, just sorry, didn't want to interrupt. Please finish your um, thought. No, no, you go ahead. Yeah, um, Marta put a um, very good comment in the chat box. Um, really linking the work with the um, around the indicators in CPMS with the work that the work, our working group did uh, for child well-being indicators. Um, maybe uh, I will um, invite you, Martha, please unmute yourself because uh, I, I agree that that was very important work and there are indicators there that would be um, great to point attention to. I'm unmuting, but I don't think I have anything more to say, just that when we think about prevention, we think about well-being and the well-being indicators and the contextualization guide were done with tremendous care by this committee. And I find them useful. Our social work members find them very useful. So I hope that others will also find them useful in thinking about prevention initiatives. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks. And I will put the link in the chat. Yeah, thanks for raising that, Martha. And please feel free to unmute yourself as well. If you have questions, you can ask them. You don't have to write them into the group map. Um, yeah, maybe just in addition to, to what Martha mentioned, what we did with the child well-being indicator um, table was we really looked at child, children's age and developmental stages. So we looked at key developmental indicators. So this was quite different than the indicators that you'll find in the CPMS. And as um, they're kind of categorized um, in four separate domains and per, per age group. So it's quite an interesting table because we really looked at with um, a child well-being advisory committee as well as the AIM working group members um, that were interested in this specific activity. Um, we really looked at what were the key developmental indicators per each domain, per um, kind of the main age groups of children. Um, so in that sense, they are kind of preventive, preventive by nature. Just wanna add one thing to that that's in there 
and a pet of mine, but they're very much in there that when the contextualization guide was being done and the indicators were being developed, it was very, this is not what you'll get out of any child development textbook. They're very clearly contextualized so that people can apply them in their own context for that would be appropriate for children in living in in circumstances that are not those that are traditionally included in the textbook. So I'm a fan. Thanks, Martha. And you're instrumental in, in supporting and developing the child well-being guides. So um, yeah, we, we really paid attention to what child practitioner, child protection practitioners would be able to measure. Um, so it, they are quite, um, they were kind of intentionally kept quite simple. Um, we kind of stayed away from, um, you know, areas that might require more, um, more of a stronger technical background, you know, related to MHPSS or uh, children's, like, you know, measuring uh, motor skills, um, that sort of thing. We really kind of wanted child protect protection practitioners to then be coordinating with other sector actors. And I see here, there's a question around intersectoral um, measurement. So that's um, one thing we would like to work on uh, over this, this coming year. I think in the previous session, um, the CPMS working group had mentioned pillar four and working across sectors. It's something that we've been discussing within the AIM working group as well. How would we strengthen uh, measurement um, and integrated assessments, multi-sectoral assessments um, with our other sector colleagues? Um, so it's not something we've really moved forward on uh, very much, but it's something that we recognize and would like to um, take up over the coming years as well. Um, so I see a question around, um, around assessment with children with disabilities. So this was something that came up by our members. It was an activity that they wanted to prioritize uh, over this with in our um, current upcoming work plan. So we do actually, we fundraised for that last year and we um, were successful in obtaining some funds. So we'll be moving forward with a specific activity around um, how do we identify risk and protective factors um, to prevent harmful outcomes specific to this vulnerable group of children. Um, and what our, men our members highlighted what, was that um, some of the existing tools kind of focus on children with um, physical disabilities and not with intellectual and cognitive impairment. So we would really like with this um, upcoming activity and tool development to focus on um, also um, identifying risk and protective factors, um, tools that are um, appropriate for engaging children with intellectual and cognitive impairment as well. So I think this is really um, going to be an exciting activity we kind of did a, a quick mapping of the tools that are currently available and there really aren't um, many tools available. It kind of the tools that do exist um, as with many guidance documents kind of refer more simply to facilitate an assessment with children with disabilities, but then don't offer the actual tools or steps to doing so. So we would like to kind of break down the process and develop tools specifically for that. So um, if you join our working group, um, you'll be able to work on that. What we do with each of these activities in our work plan and when funding does come up is um, if you're a member and you're specifically interested in one of the activities, um, we form kind of small review groups and small groups within the AIM working group. Um, so we kind of have um, smaller groups within AIM that are specifically interested in working on specific activities like this one with children with disabilities. So if you're a member, 
you, you're not obligated to work on every activity that we work on or every piece of work. You can kind of pick and choose what you're most interested in contributing to. Um, so I think we have just one minute left and um, maybe, uh, maybe Christine, would you be able to write in our contact information if you're interested in reaching out to us at the AIM Working Group? Um, and I'll try to get to one more question. Um, did you define a virtual community volunteer group? I think that might've been more linked to the CCP. Um, task force. Um, so many existing tools for um, emergencies look at consequences for responses. Are we looking at tools which would help CP staff to better understand trends, situations around? Yes. So that's a really great question as well. Um, so that is something we would like to um, continue to work on kind of linked to the prevention initiative. Um, just maybe finishing up, I know we're right on time. Um, but last year we had wanted to look at documented risk and protective factors so that we could see what are some of the trends leading to specific harmful outcomes mm -hmm. for children. And unfortunately, what we found was that there are some documented risk factors, but very few documented protective factors. Um, so we had wanted to put together a typology framework so we can have almost like a predictive tool um, and we can see in context that might have cyclical natural disasters or in conflict settings where when a conflict moves from one location to the next, we can see, for instance, an increase in sexual violence or in a context um, where there's annual hurricanes, we see a decrease in school attendance and increase in child labor. Um, and what are some of the risk and protective factors contributing to that? So that is something we will be taking forward this next year to see how we can start better documenting that um, within the child protection coordination groups in country. Um, so that's another upcoming activity. Um, so I'm gonna stop there, I'm a minute over, um, but thank you so much for all of your questions. And Christine and I are available. Um, Mark wasn't able to join us today, but he's also available to answer any more of your AIM-related questions. If you'd like to sit in on a meeting with AIM, um, you can also do that. So please feel free to send us an email. But thank you thank everybody you. for joining. Thank you very much, Lena Kristin. Um, hope everyone enjoyed our session, our high school, and then learn more about the AIM Working Group and the CCP Task Force. So we reach to the end of the session. Sorry, we passed the two minutes. Uh, the next session will start uh, around in 13 minutes or 27 minutes at the CET 405. So it's five minutes past four o'clock in Geneva time. Uh, please have some last, get some snack, or refill your coffee, tea, uh, and then please come back to the plenary session via the field platform. Uh, we will start with the, the pitch session again. Uh, for the rest of the working group and task forces. So again, thank you very much for joining the session and see you in the next session.